Sorry. Throughout the presentation, your line will be muted. However, there is a chat box at the bottom left of your screen for your questions. Please ask questions or give comments throughout the webinar. Our facilitators will track your, your questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. I will track your logistical questions and respond through the, through the chat feature. The materials from this presentation will be recorded, archived, and posted on the WixUp website approximately two weeks after the webinar. If you are sharing a computer with your colleague to attend this webinar, you e please email the names of the other participants to jen, J-E-N, at wcsap.org. This webinar will count as 1.5 hours of ongoing training credits, and you will receive a follow-up email from us for your records. Please take a few minutes to fill out the evaluation. Today we are joined by, Les by Sandra Harrell. Sandra Harrell has began her tenure with the Vera Institution of Justice in 2006. She is a project director in Vera Institute of Justice Center on Victimization and Safety, and her work focuses on helping individuals, organizations, and communities across the country address violence against adults and children with disabilities. She oversees a variety of projects, including a friendly, a federally funded program that helps communities across the United States improve, improve their response to women with disabilities and deaf women who have experienced domestic violence, sexual violence, and stalking. Additionally, Sandra leads our efforts to address sexual abuse of children with disabilities and deaf children and serves as an internal advisor to all projects focused on the intersection of disability and violence. Um, so thank you, Sandra, for presenting this wonderful webinar. Um, you can go ahead and start. Sandra? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, you're, you're, you're live. Go ahead and go. Fantastic. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm glad that we were able to work it out so that we could reschedule this. I know the last time we attempted to do this presentation, we had a, a, a series of technical difficulties. Um, that actually was the beginning of a, a week when I, I experienced so many Internet outages that I thought that, you know, the alignment of planets was out to get me or something. So I'm so glad to be back with you all to talk a little bit about our performance indicator system. Um, I understand that you all will be using it in the state of Washington, and the Vera Institute could not be more happy about that. Uh, that was the overall design when we created the system is that we hoped that um, agencies would pick it up and use it whether or not they were part of the grant program. So I'll get started. Um, so also, just so you know, um, my colleague Leslie Myers was supposed to be um, co-presenting with me on this, but um, it, she's actually out on medical leave now, so it'll just be me the entire time. So feel free to add some questions in that Q&A bank over there to mix it up a little bit. Um, so just to give you an overview of the performance indicator measurement system, or what performance indicators are in general. Um, when we were uh, trying to figure out a way to determine um, whether or not the agencies who are trying to serve survivors with disabilities, um, we're doing so um, effectively. Uh, there were a number of different evaluation tools that we, we thought about, um, but the one that kept coming back up as being incredibly user-friendly and relying on data that, you, that should already exist within your agency was a methodology called performance indicators. And this essentially measures your organization by field standards, um, as I established field standards. And those field standards, you know, um, depending on the field that you're looking at, um, could be all sorts of different things. But there we identified, and you'll see this in um, future slides, um, uh, about <clears throat> 40 field standards uh, for, for serving, effectively serving survivors with disabilities. <clears throat> And then the reason we like the performance indicators is that, again, it really was a, a user-friendly um, uh, sort of tool that, that, that people who have zero experience with evaluation could use. But we also liked it because it is um, a point-in-time measure that really demonstrates for people their, their um, progress or regress towards a particular goal. <clears throat> and that's what our system is, is designed to do. Just to give you a little bit of background on the indicators. Um, uh, they are um, 
they will allow users to really be able to, like I said, to get a point, point in time snapshot of how you're do doing towards a particular goal. Um, using that snapshot, um, it will allow you to develop a strategic plan for addressing any gaps that you identify. Indicators are, um, are, are supposed to be easily measured details um, that w represent a harder to measure abstract concept. We, use, we like to use this, um, this analogy of the weather. You know, if you ask somebody what the weather is like and they say, oh, it's pretty nice outside, um, you might want to get a, a variety of, of details about what, what makes it nice outside. Oh, well, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty warm, but not too warm. It's, you know, the sun is shining, uh, the, the ground is dry, um, and there's not a lot of humidity, you know. So those things kind of give you more concrete examples of this abstract concept of the weather is nice. Um, but indicators really must be concrete, um, and they must be measurable. Um, so, you know, there are so many different things that you might um, want to measure when it comes to serving survivors with disabilities. But we had to select indicators that were concrete that you could actually see, um, and indicators that, that would be able to be recorded and scored so that they are measurable. Um, so you'll you'll see when, when we get into talking about some of the indicators that, um, you know, we are not trying to measure the entire universe of being able to effectively serve survivors with disabilities. We've chosen um, indicators based on field standards uh, that measure different perspectives of a particular concept, but it's certainly not going to measure every single solitary thing that you might want to see in there. And that's um, one of the things that a lot of people have like struggle with at first is they're like, well, why aren't you asking about this or this or this or this? And it's just because we, um, you know, the, the, you're not the indicators are not designed to be completely comprehensive. It, instead, they give you a sort of a snapshot of a, of a more abstract concept, and they are designed to be collected over time. <clears throat> so you will get a point in time baseline score. And what you want to do is every six months or every year, depending on how the Washington Coalition structures it, <clears throat> you'll collect that data again to see how well you're, you're making progress towards your goal of, of improving services. So as mentioned before, um, the fundamental stuff about indicators is no single indicator is good enough. You really want to um, look at uh, take a multifaceted approach to understanding a particular concept. So like um, access and safety, those are really sort of abstract concepts, right, um, that, that you want to look at from a number of different perspectives to be able to kind of get a good sense of um, whether or not something is accessible or something is safe. Um, generally, um, groups of four to six complementary indicators are used to measure that one broad concept. Um, and in, it's also important to keep in mind that no single data source is perfect. So you'll be drawing from multiple data sources when you're using the indicators. Um, you know, the, the data sources that you'll be drawing from, as I mentioned already, are sources that you should already have um, within your agency. So policies, procedures, you know, an agency's strategic plan, any internal MOUs that you have. You'll also be drawing upon agency knowledge, so there are just a handful of questions that you might have to ask people. Um, and then there's some observations that you'll, have to, that you'll have to make, but all of that should be within your agency already. We've kind of touched upon this already, that the measures help to answer the question of how much or whether progress is being made. They are simple, easily understood pieces of information, um, and they must be concrete, as we've mentioned already. Um, we've developed a total of five sets of performance indicators. We've de developed indicators to help measure disability service organizations, residential domestic violence agencies, non-residential domestic violence agencies, rape crisis centers, and dual domestic and sexual violence centers. Um, so um, those are the types of agencies that can use the indicators now. At this point, um, we are developing indicators for deaf agencies as well, um, but we're still in the process of wrapping that up. 
So the indicators are developed around um, uh, different components. Um, so for the ones that you'll be using, you'll be looking at your commitment and capacity component. And the way that we've defi the, uh, defined commitment is, is a willingness and determination to serve survivors of domestic and sexual violence of disabilities. And capacity, what we're trying to measure there is the knowledge, skills, and programmatic capabilities, um, whether or not the agency has those in place. So within each component, there is a set of themes that we're also measuring. So within the commitment component, we have the theme of responsibility, partnerships, and policies. And within the capacity component, we have the theme of material resources, human resources, and programmatic um, activities, or if it's a disability organization, um, pr pr um, pr protocols, what protocols you have in place. And then within each theme, there is a set of indicators. Um, so within looking at the commitment component, you look at the theme of responsibility, there are six indicators that we identify to determine whether or not um, the agency is taking responsibility around uh, addressing uh, violence against uh, people with disabilities within their agencies. And those six indicators each have four measures. Um, so within the theme of responsibility, if you're looking at the recognizes as a priority um, indicator, the way we are measuring that indicator is looking at whether the agency recognizes violence against people with disabilities as a priority by specifically mentioning people with disabilities and deaf people in agency's public outreach brochure or social media accounts including efforts to increase agencies' accessibility for people with disabilities and deaf people in your agency's strategic plan, having an internal committee or work group focused on enhancing the agency's response to domestic and sexual violence, and having a client non-discrimination policy that explicitly includes disability status. So again, those four measures are not intended to be everything that you would want to know to, um, about whether or not an agency recognizes this as a priority, but they are four concrete ways that you, concrete pieces of evidence that you can look for in an agency to paint enough of a picture to say, okay, if you have these four things in place, then we can say that you are recognizing this as a priority. Yes, I'm sure there are a dozen other things that you might want to see in place, but um, these four were chosen because they were measurable and concrete. This is sort of an example of just the overall commitment component. Um, uh, the, 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 here's the component, which is commitment. And within each component, there's the theme. One is responsibility, partnerships, and policies. And then each of these themes has um, five to six indicators associated with it. And this is the capacity component. As you can see here, the capacity um, component it, uh, has this, these three themes of material resources, and those would be agencies' um, resources such as printed materials, your physical location. We're really looking here, because this is for a violence against women agency, we're looking at um, accessibility to people um, with disabilities and deaf people. So looking at accessible modes of communication, accessible location, alternate formats, inclusive materials. Within human resources, we're really looking at sort of the, the people um, who are providing the services. Um, so we're looking at inclusive hiring practices, direct services, staff, um, practical learning opportunities, and volunteer recruitment and training. And then when you get into programmatic resources and activities, we just sort of uh, looked at the most common types of um, activities or services provided at, at each of the types of agencies that we developed indicators for, and then um, identified sort of what sorts of measures we can look for within each of those to determine if they were accounting for people with disabilities in their work. Some of the key considerations for selecting the indicators. Um, we wanted to make sure um, that we were addressing domestic and sexual violence, both within disability organizations and vice versa, that we were addressing 
um, uh, domestic, uh, we were, that we were addressing disability within domestic and sexual violence agencies. Um, we had to choose indicators that were in the realm of possibility. Um, so we, we wanted to make sure that we were not um, putting something into these indicators that could never be achieved. But you will see that some of the indicators are going to be harder to achieve. Um, so, for instance, um, one of the indicators that you'll see for a, a disability organization is uh, around mandatory reporting. Um, and we know that, um, uh, what, that the field standards is that if, if you are a mandated reporter, that there's somebody within your agency who is not mandated to report, that there is one, at least one avenue for confidential support um, for a person with disability within your agency. But in some states, that's just not possible because the, the, the law is law. You know, the, the law doesn't allow for that. So that's a harder to achieve indicator because um, the expectation is that um, you know, recognizing that you want to provide the best possible services means that you have to provide one, at least one avenue of confidential support um, that agencies would have to then work for many years to, to change the way that the law is structured to allow for that. Um, and then, so, so that, by making those sort of harder to achieve indicators in place, this will be something that will be applicable to um, agencies no matter how much work you've been doing. I mean, ultimately, the goal is everyone gets 100%, but and we also, uh, just because of the design of the system, um, recognize that not everyone will be getting 100% anytime soon. Some of the data sources that you'll be drawing for, from um, will, will be agency documents, agency observations, and staff interview questions. The staff interview questions are very short and sweet. Um, it's just basically trying to gain knowledge that someone may just hold in their brain and have it documented. Um, and so the, the, the documents that you'll pull are intake forms, policies, procedures, training materials, and any resource sheets that you draw upon. Um, and then the agency observations, we actually give you an observation guide, and you just kind of have to go through and make either take measurement or, or take notes about whether or not something is or is not um, available within your agency. Sort of uh, just an example of how the data sources um, relate to the measures. Um, so going back to um, the, the theme of recognizing as a priority, um, you'll be looking at your outreach brochure to determine whether or not it specifically mentions people with disabilities and deaf people. Um, you'll be looking at your agency's strategic plan to see if it includes efforts to increase agency's accessibility for people with disabilities. Um, having an internal committee or work group, you would be looking for a work group roster, um, and then of course, if you um, are looking to see if your non-discrimination policy explicitly includes disability status, you would look at your non-discrimination policy to see that. Okay, so scores are based off a point scale ranging from zero to 100. Um, uh, you know, scores of anything below 33 are considered low. Between 34 to 66 are considered moderate, and anything over 67 um, is considered a high score. Just keep that in mind. But also keep in mind that when you collect your baseline data, the assumption is that you will have a lower score. Um, you know, I fought with our research people about even having a number attached to the, score, to the scoring because I know how deflating that can be for agencies who've been working really hard to achieve something within their agencies and then they, they see they've got a score of 27. But that's really to be expected because keep in mind some of those indicators are harder to achieve. And the expectation is that um, you, may, you may not be achieving some of these indicators for several years in the future. So before we get into how to use the performance indicators in your organization, does anyone have any questions that you want to type into the Q&A box just to mix this up a little? Okay. 
Okay. Look at Looks like we're not getting any questions at this point. So I will just head right into how to use the performance indicators in your organization. Um, so this process that I'm laying out here um, is, is based on the process that is used within the disability grant program um, when agencies are, are, using, are collecting data for their indicators. Um, if you find that it is easier um, to do this, this a little bit differently, feel free to do so. As long as you're collecting the agencies and you're, or the, the data and you're recording that data as accurately and thoroughly as possible, um, you, it will you know, uh, result in the same thing. Um, but this is a process that we recommend um, uh, for the, for the grantees that we work with. Um, first and foremost, we, re we recommend that you spend some time familiarizing yourself with the indicators. Um, a lot of times what we see is, is grantees will pick them up and they'll have a dozen questions about using the indicators, um, and then they're on a much tighter time frame of, of like being able to get their, their data together and to us um, as it's required. And so really, um, I would, if, if I were doing this, I would um, just have whoever, whoever is going to be responsible for collecting the data, really kind of read through the indicators, flag anything that you have a question about, and then you can always come back to us and we can help answer those questions and then you feel fully prepared <clears throat> when you start to uh, score your indicators. Um, we have created indicator guides um, uh, for each agency type, which you can find on our End of Use of People with Disabilities website. Um, so I would also um, recommend that you review those, those guides um, because we tried to proactively answer questions about why particular indicators were chosen. Um, and then if you, if you continue to have questions, you can um, you can certainly come back to us. And then, of course, take a look at the data collection guides and scoring sheets, um, just so you're familiar, you're familiar with those pieces of this system. And then importantly, figure out who within your agency is going to be responsible for data collection. Um, it should be one person, um, and, and it, you know, that is charged with being able to pull all of the different data sources that you'll ultimately use to score your indicators. Um, if you, uh, as you can see, this is based off of our um, uh, recipients of the Disability Grant Program. They, they generally have a project director, um, but you might just say, okay, Sally, um, you're responsible for pulling all of this data for us. Um, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be anyone in particular. Sandra, um, you have a Yes, yes. Um, one of them is, uh, how is it most effective way to help staff understand the need for increased awareness access when the crisis center and shelter has limited staff and only a small number of beds? Well, that's, I mean, that I think is a, is a process that, um, that just requires, I mean, this is part of why we created the indicator system is, um, you know, helping people who are already spread very thin um, take a step back to see why it's so important to be able to serve survivors with disabilities um, does take a little bit of time, but it helps to have some data associated with it, which is why the indicators are there. Um, but I would say that um, one of the things that I say whenever we, we do this work out in communities is that in general, you're already serving people with disabilities. Um, this is not about increasing the number of people that you're serving um, necessarily. It's making your services more accessible um, and making sure that they are, that, that the services that you provide um, are being responsive to the, the varying needs of people who come through your door. It is, you know, given, especially the domestic violence program, um, just highly unlikely that you're not serving people, for instance, with, with mental illness or somebody who has experienced traumatic brain injury, um, having been um, assaulted many, many times, you know, around the head, um, or someone who doesn't come to you with a pre-existing medical condition. I mean, it's just um, highly unlikely that that's the case. And so help, making your services more accessible um, it just helps 
benefit those you're already serving. Um, and then I see the question about where are the guides one more time. Those guides are on our end of use of people with disabilities website. And um, at the, I, I believe that we have that website on the last slide of this presentation. If not, I'll be sure to send a link to the guides um, to um, Annette so that she can get it out to all of you after this presentation. Um, I see another question. Are there any grant opportunities available for crisis centers who want to integrate these indicators but may not have the staff capacity to have someone do this? Perhaps grant opportunities that would allow centers that hire part-time staff who can specifically focus on this. Um, if you haven't already looked into the disability grant program through the Office on Violence Against Women, I highly encourage you to do so. Um, the, this, that grant program is designed um, specifically around building the capacity of organizations to be able to better serve survivors with disabilities. Um, and, you know, it, it really relies on a model of collaboration with a disability organization, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you would agree that we can't be all things to all people and, you know, everyone brings their own sort of expertise and from their lane. And when you collaborate, you're able to combine that expertise and, and leverage resources. So I would highly recommend um, if you haven't already looked into the Disability Grant Program to do so. I believe the solicitation is launching on December 18th. So they, there's even a there's a um, a webinar that OVW is hosting to answer any questions about it. It's the Office um, on Violence Against Women. Not it's not OVC. It's OVW. And it's called the Disability Grant Program. And if you need more information about that, we can send some uh, follow-up information about that as well. Okay, so these are the sort of um, uh, collection guides that I've, I've referenced already. There's a document checklist. That, that is a checklist of all the documents that would need to be pulled. If you don't have the document, you just don't have the document and you get a zero, um, and that, which is fine. Again, this is not about shaming you. It's really just helping you get a snapshot of how you're doing on, on something. And then there's an observation guide. You can see there's just a handful of questions there. And then the staff interview guide questions, which again, there's just a handful of questions there. So once you've pulled all of the information, you'll then go through the scoring tool, which is currently an Excel file. And you'll answer a series of yes, no questions about the data that you've collected. Um, the, the electronic scoring tool automatically computes scores at the indicator level, the component level, and the overall agency score. Um, and then the scores are just based on the percent of measures met. So this is an example of the scoring tool. Um, is, so there's a Bright Crisis Center Collection Guide, agency responses, and you go through and, you know, look at your observation guide. You see it's tiny, but it's at the bottom here. Um, and you'll, you'll check yes if, if you can answer yes to all four of these questions. And that will populate your score here. And this is, a, this, like, this is your um, computation of the commitment um, component. And you can see uh, they've got about a 20% in responsibility, a little higher in uh, partnerships, which is great, but they're very small. They've, they've got a lot of work to do around their policies. They've got a zero in their policies. Yes, so um, we did include it um, here at the end of the, of the PowerPoint. Um, so we have I included a link here to uh, the Rate Crisis Center Implementation Guide and Scoring Tool and the Dual um, Domestic and Sexual Violence Implementation Guide and Scoring Tool. So that is the, that is the indicator system. Um, 
I realize uh, that it may you may have a lot more questions when you actually start to use it. Um, but I wanted to see if anybody had any additional questions. Okay, I see that you can't copy and paste the links. Um, we will send the links out directly, and um, and then you'll be able to access these materials. Anything else? Okay, there's a question that says, I'm on your website and cannot find your publication center. Um, with, on the website, what you're going to be looking for is the Stay Informed page. If you go into views, um, there you see the problem, the solution, get connection, stay informed. If you go to Stay Informed, it will it'll bring you to publications. Um, and then there's a question about are there any current provisions under VAWA, VAWA or VOCA that mandate access? Um, I, I don't know that they're necessarily specific to VAWA or VOCA, but there's certainly anyone who receives federal funds is subject to the Rehab Act of 1973. Um, and then, and, you know, those that are not covered by federal funds that get private funds are subject to the Americans with Disabilities Act, all of which require access. But I, you know, I, I often say this when I'm talking to people from the domestic and sexual violence world, which is, you know, we are a movement that is about serving all survivors and being as inclusive as possible. And so while, yes, there's a legal mandate that you'll be accessible, um, it, you know, that shouldn't be the only reason we're doing it. You know, we're, like, right, we shouldn't be legally required to serve someone who's experienced sexual violence well, right? We, that's something we want to do anyways. Um, so I do realize that, uh, the, uh, you know, having a legal requirement gives you a little bit of peace when you're going to your board of directors and saying we need to raise money around all of this. But um, the spirit of, of why we're doing it should be really centered in the fact that we are a movement that is, is, has as a goal to be as inclusive as possible. And then um, if you receive any transitional housing funds, um, the Fair Housing Act would apply as well. If there are not any more questions, <clears throat> I want to remind every. Oh, do you want to address that, Sandra? Um, so there's a, there's a comment here that says, I feel that part of the problem is that lack of discussion of domestic violence, sexual assault within the disability community. Absolutely. Um, this is why the disability grant program is structured to be <clears throat> um, based on a collaborative relationship. And we talk about collaboration until we're blue in the face because this is not um, a situation where it's just a matter of domestic and sexual violence programs becoming more accessible. It's also a matter of disability organizations becoming a better place where someone can disclose um, because for so many people with disabilities, their disability agency <clears throat> is a part of their they're, you know, every every day or um, every every week they're in touch with their disability program. And if that program isn't addressing domestic and sexual violence as part of their services, then the people that are going there on a regular basis may never ne never feel that they can tell someone that they trust about what's happening in their lives. So I completely agree that this is a, this is not a one-sided DV program. SA, SA programs need to get better about um, access. This is about all of us 
who are going to interact in the lives of people with disabilities need to get better. <clears throat> Thank you, Sandra, for presenting this wonderful webinar. As a reminder for everyone, please fill out the short evaluation and let us know if there are others on the webinar with you. You can email that to Jen, J-E-N, at WCSAP.org. A recording of today's webinar and materials will be posted on our website under trainings and recorded webinars, possibly in a couple of weeks. So thank you everybody for joining and uh, hope you have the rest of your day. Thank you.